Thank you all for staying for the fourth and final hour of, of brain tickling. Um, so it occurs to me actually that we, we are in kind of a nice position in that we've, we've lined up these different, and thanks to Jan for doing this, I'm sure it was not an accident, but we have this kind of nice progression of different eras of how to think about this problem of unifying pitch and time and, and unifying sound and space. And we've seen it from you know going back uh, to Terman and then the, the um, what was what was happening at the beginning of of John's work and and now we're sort of brought up to the present day. So I wanted to ask first about I mean for those of us who were for those of us who were here yesterday and got to experience this piece. You know I think um, we we talked in the lead up to to how to how to discuss these things about. Um, well, first about framing the problem in a really kind of academic way, which was to think about mathematics and sort of how mathematics get sonified. Um, but when you have the experience of this music, that sounds really, dr if, you ha if you hadn't had this experience and somebody tried to describe it to you, that might sound really dry, you know, sort of some, some, some sort of experience of mathematics and sound. And the same would be true, I think, of John's work until you heard it. Um, when you actually experience it, though, because these things are playing with perception, you have a very, a very different, a very different sense of it, which is something that's that's really essential. And I guess my first question was, to what extent is our understanding of of mathematics something that's emergent? Right. This is an idea in mathematical philosophy that 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 our whole understanding of what math is comes from our bodies and the way that our brains operate as gray matter. Is the is is the desire to go after some of these kind of mathematical ideas something that comes out of the sensory ex experience of sound? Well, uh, just to ask an easy question <laughs> to warm up with, <laughs> softball. Yeah. I well, you could start on various levels uh, with this. Uh, obviously, the Pythagoreans already have discovered uh, kind of uh, um, kind of. Uh, in similar proportions, uh, or, or our under, uh, that our perception of harmony, or something that we perceive as uh, very consonant, is um, also expressible in numbers and number proportions. Uh, the octave as uh, a proportion of two, two, uh, two, uh, two, one, and and the fifth as three to two, 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 and the third uh, as four to three, and so on. Um, so there is, uh, uh, on, on the level of harmonic perception, uh, and this is somehow also connected to uh, what John was talking about uh, of the Fibonacci series and the golden ratio, um, there are certain kinds of equivalence between, uh, between numbers or arithmetics and uh, or, or, uh, uh, ratios uh, that are uh, equal to our perception. Uh, so that's a very obvious uh, thing to say. Um, but then there's also these kind of questions: what what is mathematics, or what what, what where does this concept uh, come from? That's a much more. So do we discover um, these numbers, or where, where does the concept of number come from? Uh, how is that something that is already implemented in nature and we just observe it, or is that something that our brains make up? Uh, and yeah, then you're in a, a little bit of a different of a sphere. Well, maybe, let, maybe let's start with some of the sounds that we heard uh, yesterday. So, um, of course, the thing we, when we put this in the, in the marketing material, so people n knew it was advertised, they knew they were going to get it. The first thing were these uh, shepherd tones and the, the experience of kind of sound seeming to ascend in this uh, barber pole fashion. But there's some other stuff going on in that piece beyond just, just that. And that, that sort of makes it sound, I, I want to come back to formally, compositionally, how this works. Um, so it, to me, it was more than kind of a bag of tricks. But there are some things that are going on that, that make a big, big impression. W what are some of the other techniques that you're using to, to, to play with perception, particularly in this piece, in this sort of newer work? Mm -hmm. Well, basically, 
there are two different compositional ideas in in the piece. One is the work as you described, the shepherd tone, um, which appears in a way that you almost hardly recognize that uh, a shepherd tone is at work. Um, I suppose most of you know what the shepherd tone is, the barber pole uh, kind of idea. Um, the other material, which is kind of um, uh, material that I work with very experimentally and um, if you want uh, in, a, in a way that I explore my own hearing with with that is the work with difference tones and autoacoustic emissions and things that our um, the physics of our ear exp um, produces actively or in a way that is uh, is triggered by uh, um, yeah by triggers and um, these are the kind of two materials that are important for the piece I performed yesterday for Tuna Ribbon, yes. Do you want to play something so that we can sort of start out with some sound? I'm, I think I'm just looking for an excuse to mess with people's ears right mm -hmm. off the bat. Well, uh, well, I could, uh, because I have been working with that kind of material f uh, for a while actually by now, and I could give an example of an, quite an, an older piece uh, called Altars of Science from 2008, uh, where um, I had an implementation of this uh, different tone phenomena. Well, I, I jump into the piece a little bit. say much more than anything else I'm I'm really interested in uh, how how I can uh, integrate these kind of effects into a composition mm -hmm. uh -huh. what well, I mean what first drew what first drew you to this to this effect what was the first thing that was kind of made you say this seems, seems like something that you want to work with hmm. maybe a uh, discovery of uh, of my own uh, rather than uh, any kind of uh, I mean, obviously, uh, various composers have worked with these kind of phenomena in the past, but uh, since, um, uh, yeah, I had a specific interest in in a physicality of or, or physical quality next to an intellectual uh, quality of the sound. So it, I, I like how sounds actually uh, affect our. Our, our ears, or even you know, uh, our trousers in with bass sounds and so on. So um, I experimented with with that and just uh, came to uh, you know, just by discovering this for myself very uh, personally, I started to investigate more in, into the phenomena. I mean, something really substantial happens, right? I mean, this this is the the moment that this happens, and we're also watching videos of other performances of yours. This seems to be the moment that everybody kind of like physically responds or puts their fingers in their ears or you know some, some, something's going on there. I mean, my sense of it was, and maybe you can correct this, but that there was kind of somehow this fuses spatial and timbral perception, and that you your, your brain is both trying to process the, the the timbre of what's going on, but then you also have this spatial dislocation, and then uh, since the uh, I guess because the inner ear is trying to 
spatialize the sound, then you have this kind of physical sensations inside the ear, for mm. me at least. I, yeah. I don't know, is that, is that accurate? Am I guessing at this correctly? Well, what, um, similar to what uh, John was saying already earlier, my previous work or my, my work is constantly uh, also trying to integrate spatialization of electronic sound or of some, maybe even for my instrumental music, I try to uh, work on ideas how to conceptualize uh, space as a uh, parameter of sound and music and uh, the specific thing, thing about uh, or the specific quality of uh, of these different tone phenomena and autoacoustic phenomena is that we lose the perception of space completely. Uh, it seems that the space just uh, appears through the, the movement of our heads or our ears and uh, uh, because the ear is an active part in the process of, of the hearing. So um, a lot of the sounds that we hear from this type of quality in the piece yesterday were only mono. So there is, although it appears to come from everywhere or depending on how we move our heads, uh, um, it's only a mono source, which is quite fascinating for someone like me who spends a lot of research in how to spatialize sounds. And the, now, the, sor the source is mono, but then by the time it's in the space, it ceases to be mono, right, because of standing waves and reflections and, and things. So it's, it's not just an illusion. Or um, what, what is it? How much, of that, how much of that spatialization is kind of... Well, this is actually kind of an impossible question to answer, maybe, but how, how, much of that, how much of that is kind of the perception of the brain and how much of that is acoustically occurring in the space um, causing this sort of confusion? I'd suppose you would have to talk to the psychoacoustic specialist on, on this question about uh, what, uh, what, what you can actually measure, but uh, most important from, for, for me in my work is um, that it appears for the listener as something that is, uh, you know, independent from the amount of speakers or, or, I mean, it requires a certain volume. That's an aspect that's quite important for this. So that's one of the reasons why the music is actually quite loud also, because the effect just doesn't uh, um, reproduce under say 90 dBs or so, or is best uh, maybe perceived at 96 dBs or around around this. Um, but yeah, well. That's a good question. So yeah, we, we were talking a bit with, with John about this and sort of safety and, and, and loudness. But what, what we were hearing was 96 dB from the mixing board yesterday, or how, how because I'd, not only does it confuse my perception, I, noticed, well, I was actually watching my watch and noticing that, and I usually have a pretty good perception of time in a piece, noticing it was completely wrong, mm -hmm. um, totally messed with my perception of, of space. Um, but I think it was also very much confusing my perception of loudness. So is this sort of 96 dB front of house, or? Well, I didn't uh, sit sit in front. There, there's obviously uh, some amount of uh, of of live uh, uh, mixing and 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 also you know work at spatialing, spatialization and and EQing uh, going on during the performance. But um, it was probably around 99 dBs. We measured uh, stuff in the sound check, and um, yeah, I'm, it's hard to tell, but between. 96 and 99, I would say. So that's sort of earplug material if you're going to listen well, to it for a while, but not well, quite. Uh, maybe I'm. I, I should. I could correct myself as well, um, because uh, the obviously the the high frequency material uh, uses less energy, and and we know that um, there's a various ways of actually measuring volume with also frequency frequency dependence. So it's also questions of which uh, db, a, c, uh, and so on you're actually looking at, so. Well, so then walk us through maybe the beginning of the process. I mean, we, uh, of course, when, when, when John is getting started with Music 4, this is like a, you know, trying things out on punch cards, waiting for them to render and hearing the results. And then we have kind of the analog approach where you can sort of plug things from one to another and see what happens. How do you go about finding these sounds. You're kind of playing around with just the raw materials before it gets composed. How are you sort of discovering the way that this stuff works or um, uh, developing those, those raw materials? 
maybe there, uh, there are two different ways uh, of how I approach it. One is, um, say, uh, more from a coming uh, like a, a top level uh, approach where I'm not so interested in the material itself yet, uh, where I'm rather um, looking at uh, what is something interesting that produces a, a, a kind of difference or something that is a, a different kind of experience within the context that th something is represented rather than you know the exact material so that which is also one of the reasons why I you know work with different kind of material like general musical identities if you want um, so that's one approach that also kind of requires uh, thoughts about uh, historical developments and and things that are actually you know, not okay to do or that are accepted or acceptable or that are kind of toying with with um, um, norms or or, um, or or conventions, if you want. So it's it's really starting in this the the level of kind of s thinking about it as a social intervention before you get into well, so specific. I, I, I'm not sure about the order, but. Um, okay. uh, that's also kind of a, an important aspect of, of, of how I come to investigate into and, and also how, how deep I start investigating into a certain kind of material. Because um, from a you know, technical level or from, a, from a, you know, the, the amount of research that has been spent on it, it's, this is not so uh, super complex or uh, on on these kind of levels so, but it's also kind of has a level of playfulness and and also of quotes if you want because there's you know this obviously you know these phenomena a lot of them are not invented by me at all or you know not new or anything like that but uh, it's it's almost like bringing them to in a different context uh, i mean shepherd tone for example was uh, an invention from the 1960s, and and Marion Amache work with uh, you know these kind of in-ear phenomena, uh, probably from the late 70s on. Well, so with that in mind, what 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 do you bring that's that's unique? If we just take yesterday as an example, so you have a whole body of work. Um, what do you? I mean, we 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 heard the idea that uh, earlier that Theremin was really interested in mass hypnosis as kind of a performance objective. You could see why the KGB loved him. Um, but um, f for you, did you have kind of an objective in mind for, for what you want the audience to experience? Is this more about kind of understanding that through the filter of what you experience when you hear it? Or, um, I mean, we saw some, some, some different reactions and some of us were thoroughly enjoying whatever was happening to us. But, but um, what sort of experience do you want people to have from that? Hmm. Or maybe you, maybe you don't know. <laughs> well, uh, I know that I don't want to control the experience. I mean, or let's say I I, I present this also as my work in in terms of you know that's material and and uh, methods and so on that interest me and um, I'm happy to share that but I'm I'm and I guess there's also a little bit of in intensity uh, going on while the during the listening process for myself and that's something that I can share with with the audience um, I mean, I suppose this gets into the philosophy of music a little bit, because if I said, well, yesterday I went into a concert hall and I sat down and for a while I listened to a performance and it transformed my perception of the passage of time through sounds that I heard um, reflected into the space into my inner ear. And um, it also changed my perception of pitch and, and compositional structure through perceptive things that were happening in my inner ear. I could use that same description in some level to describe listening to a Haydn string quartet. Is, 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 is there some difference between those two things? Or, or are, we, 
are we kind of um, uh, understanding a different angle for, for what the, the practice of music is? I think that's a, a good question um, because it, it points, uh, you know, to the context of contemporaneous or, or what, what we uh, perceive as something that is uh, new or different or, uh, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, I mean, there are obviously sources uh, where Beethoven uh, is quoted by contemporaries as pure noise or as something unlistenable, um, which kind of indicates that uh, our perception of what is, you know, that, for example, harmony is something that is very much uh, embedded into a uh, kind of a normative or, or convention um, that develops through, through time. Through well, us. so maybe instead of going all the way back, I mean, actually, Haydn does have this idea of playfulness, too, I think, so, which is kind of related to what you're doing. Um, but maybe without trying to wrap our brains all the way back to the, to the 18th century, if, if, if we go just back to John Chowning, I mean, I, I, the, the pieces that, that we play today, I think it's clear that they resonate with, with Holly, who's a um, musician of my generation, if I'm generous with my age. And, um, you know, hearing these things, they sound really, really fresh. Is, is there some sort of... Um, is there some sort of reason in 2016 to kind of go back to these techniques of Rizé and Chowning and um, uh, things that were happening in the 60s and 70s and present them in, in a way that's somehow new? Because it this seems like there's something that's new about what you're doing with them, right? This, the, to me, this doesn't just sound like now I'm at a uh, 1970 tape music concert, apart from the moving lights, but even if those weren't there. Hmm. Um, yeah, I hope so. Um... Otherwise, uh, <laughs> I would be in trouble uh, in, in in some ways. But uh, um, I, I guess it is also arguable, and and that's a good thing. Uh, I would say. I mean, you could maybe say, mm, no, this is not new at all. Or uh, I mean, um, the best thing that can happen is that we get into a kind of conversation about what we observe or what what we you know what we make of an experience like that um, would it affect you differently if someone came up to you and said well that was really really new i'm glad that you did that the sense that you've made this contemporary or if someone said now i now i maybe not as a criticism but now i think that that um, what you're doing is an excellent presentation of sort of classical 1970 electronic music thank you for <laughs> doing that would you prefer one of those answers to the other no not really no um i mean it is also not that i mean i it is the question what kind of conversation arises from from these kind of comments uh, it's also you know always the question what's the you know the next step after uh, y you have a thought like this and what what comes out of it and what you do with that um, but obviously i i every everybody has to follow their own kind of impulses and, and instincts of what they consider um, is something they are interested in or what they think is the right thing to do at a specific time. And, and that's the most important, you know. So you have this kind of broad conception of, of what you want this stuff to mean. You, you, you know some of the ways that these work. How, how did something like the, this performance yesterday develop just on the sound side? How, how did you start to develop that into a compositional structure? Or what, what sort of refinements took, took place? Well, um, I mean, maybe I should say, uh, before this gets uh, uh, too arbitrary, um, that I sometimes I really start with a very precise conceptual idea and really focus on finishing something like in a, in a very strict conceptual manner. In this case, uh, I'm, you know, really playing around with these kind of artifacts that techniques uh, offer, or that, for example, the shepherd tone, which was actually uh, implemented uh, into Super Collider by uh, my friend Alberto, um, who is also here uh, tonight. Um, uh, Alberto de Campo, I should say. Um, so, exploring these kind of uh, 
uh, maybe ideas as instruments or as something that we that does not offer only one effect uh, in us in a way that the shepherd tone for example has been used in the 60s and 70s uh, uh, but more in a way that um, is closer to contemporary um, ways of looking at electronic music uh, I think makes it different yeah makes it yeah, re re how do you say, revisit these, these kind of uh, um, things and explore the potential for them more than and maybe adding something to that canon that has been there, what a shepherd tone is and, you know, broadening the perspective to these kind of methods. And um, yeah, that's something I find quite interesting. Yeah. Also in, in, in other ways and other domains. So. So as you as you kind of s stretch those things, I mean, are you sort of sitting with Super Collider and changing parameters? It was kind of interesting to hear that John John was doing that kind of in the discovery of FM synthesis, if I understood that description right. So that's slower, punch cards, <laughs> wait a while, um, hope that the code executes. Um, it, 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 but is is that literally how you're doing it? Kind of messing around with parameters? And yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, I guess similar to what John was saying, um, even that just messing around with numbers uh, or you know a couple of um, uh, you know small parameters within an existing instrument uh, is actually quite a lot of effort because um, you know it is to to find uh, things that I really that I find really interesting or so. so. Yeah. Are there, is there a, um, so you're, you're using the, um, uh, Alberto's, uh, um, uh, his implementation for part of what you're doing. Are there, is there other, is there a sense of other kind of sharing or, um, uh, John talked about being in a laboratory where all the doors are open. Are there other doors that you're sort of walking through and, and pulling ideas and information from and super collider or otherwise? Mm, yeah, well, um, I, I try to. Um, whenever there, there, I see open doors. I try to walk in and um, see what happens. I mean, for this, uh, well, more in general, um, I've spent some work with sonification also, and sometimes this uh, requires, you know, ideas about what, um, what actually the nature of the data or the the material is that that you so then this this means you you talk to people that come from not from sound in the first place that are just um, working on a subject like a like in physics or in any kind of a, a scientific uh, context mm -hmm. where uh, what are what are some of the areas that you're excited about as far as sonification or where are there where are some of these transmedia connections something that that, that can make an impact or um, if, if you had to kind of chart that course now? I would say for me uh, As a composer, it's always the question what what is the potential for interesting production of, of new structures on new sound and um, it doesn't, uh, well, there's no specific domain of what is necessarily uh, particularly interesting, but um, something, uh, I mean, and obviously one of the ways of dealing with uh, sonification is uh, parameter uh, uh, or um, data-based uh, sonification that you basically have lists of uh, numbers and and put them in some kind of uh, um, musical context but uh, obviously you can also work on on uh, on models or more conceptual ideas what uh, you sonify um, and then the idea becomes uh, much more open and more like a, a philosophical question uh, and is still uh, able to pr come up with uh, exciting results that you may not have or that I would never have come up with um, if I haven't tried to implement, for example, the difference between uh, number bases if you know if you have if you compare um, you look for similarities in 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 
rhythmic pa patterns between bases of uh, of numbers. If you con compare a number um, base two to base five or base sixteen in a numerical system, then and look for rhythms, then that's in a way I would say uh, maybe this is a, s a sonification. Uh, but I know that the term sonification is also very um, uh, clearly defined, and, and you could arg argue if this is really a sonification or not. But I wait, you mean just changing the just kind of changing the the scale of the numbers is already sort of a even no, before it's heard in just, sound, or hmm? I'm sorry, even before you hear it in sound, just changing the scale of the numbers is something that you would consider relevant, um, or or you mean after after it is actually already existing in sound? What what doesn't make that sonification? Um, just if you, for example, have a um, a series of numbers and just render them in in different bases, they will produce different rhythmic patterns, mm. and these patterns produce, you know, maybe interesting sound or maybe not. And I would say this is a sonification of a of a you know a, a numerical model. If you want. Surely, mm. yeah. I mean, if you're listening to it, right? Yeah. Um, well, this this, I mean, well, I, and this kind of comes back to the question of how things may or may not be progressing. Looking back at some of the stuff from earlier this evening, some of it strikes me as a, as a little bit naive, you know, um, kind of immediately assuming that we can take the, the pitch spectrum and apply it to the time, sp to a, a temporal spectrum with a kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, it reminded me of sort of, of experiments with um, uh, um, the uh, Messiaen was kind of doing the same thing with, with pitch classes and into time. Do you, are, are those, are those but especially kind of to this question of perception, do you tend to think of those as separate axes, as, as kind of being integral in some way? Um, are, they kind of, are they kind of two different things that have a, a gray area where they start to overlap? Or, or are they something that you can think of in a totally unified way where pitch and time are completely relative and, and they're two dimensions somehow of the same thing, if that makes any sense? Well, next to pitch and time, maybe space is also an, an important parameter in, in that, um, on, on, for me at least, in, in this uh, yeah. context. And... Um, yeah, well, there's physics uh, tells us, um, you know, there's a, a on on a certain level, there's a, a very strict connection between, you know, these these parameters, uh, as as John has also uh, demonstrated, and um, and if at all, I'm trying to find the the tricks or or ways of of f uh, fiddling with that perception at least. Um, and this is, I mean, and, and I guess a lot of people before me have, uh, because uh, obviously uh, time can be perceived in, in so many different ways. And uh, I mean, if you look at it in a technical level, that's one thing. But if you look at it from the perspective of the listener, then that's another um, thing. And, and how you can work around the, this kind of linearity is something that um, I uh, consider a source of uh, uh, inspiration and, and, and exploration also. Yeah. So you're actually trying, what, what do you mean by that in terms of getting away from linearity? Well, for example, how a, a sound travels through the air uh, in a space and, and what, it may, what the timbre qualities as John has demonstrated all uh, when he showed his uh, space specialization technique uh, earlier um, that the timbre is connected to our perception of space and um, and it is interesting to try to find a way around this to to let you lose the perception of timbre although the space uh, dimension changes, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So how um, how to you know work these these uh, try to find these kind of more illogical or or these kind of gaps in the in the natural connection between these these uh, parameters as they ap appear in nature um, is something that um, that uh, is very 
yeah, can be very inspirational. At least you know if you try really hard to find these kind of wormholes, if you if you want in in that domain. Right. I mean, well, that sounds like there's a progression there, right? So John was um, John had John was sort of describing, kind of beginning with this. Um, sort of that moment of discovering how a system works, then being able to use that compositionally to kind of reproduce that same sort of natural system, then hybrid things like the bell turning into a voice where you can kind of use these rules to create something that still sounds natural but is also kind of beyond natural. And, and now you're getting us into the world of the uh, unnatural, of, of kind of pulling those rules apart so that they, they, don't, they don't function the way that, that you expect. Um, so this kind of nice, nice progression. Mm. But given that you're doing that, how do you, how do you create a, how do you create a composition? So there's a lot of disorientation in in some of your works, and because you're breaking perceptual rules. Um, but it strikes me that you, you sort of formally, you can't just kind of immediately disorient everybody, or maybe you can. Do you just sort of disorient everybody completely? Is there kind of a structure to giving them sort of signs of orientation and then turning them upside down, sort of funhouse style. I, um, how, how, do you, how do you think about that? It's a, well, it's a also a good question because it's also a tough one. Uh, there are no rules and I guess if they were, you would have to break them immediately and try to reinvent them and, and come up with something different again. Uh, it is I, from for my work. I have observed that it is good if I keep doing different methods or work ways of trying to augment. Maybe uh, that's only my perception, and, and everyone else would think, "No, uh, your work sounds always the same," or so. But uh, but um, to come up with these kind of different types of uh, strategies, how to approach uh, things and, um, well, of course you could say maybe there's a tendency of what my computer music sounds like in comparison to, you know, instrumental music or, um, or improvised music also that I also do. Um, so, um, so but when you when you improvise, you're also working through sort of di through different strategies or different techniques at, in different stages of the performance. Yeah, uh, I even use different kind of tools or or interfaces and and things like that. So it's not um, in well, improvisation is a completely different uh, thing. Maybe uh, because uh, there's a question of. I or let's put it that way. Um, if you if I work as an improviser, I mostly play, improvise with together with other uh, musicians, and then there's uh, the question of the interplay or or is there any kind of connection between the different players or or not? I mean, deliberately not, and and how w what does on which levels are these kind of um, so there are a little bit different questions also than when you maybe maybe not. I mean, you could wonder what a, what something like a counterpoint or what the difference with differences within the compositional elements were that in a piece like Yesterday Night, where where is something like a counterpoint? Where what is the the structure, the composed structure in that you you could look at it a little bit more analytically I, I suppose what what the connections there are and um, but I mean there's something comforting I think right as a listener to be able to to have these formal sections at the risk of pointing out something obvious but I noticed that in sort of the whole program yesterday with all of these kind of experimental sound experiences that we were having that um, each of the pieces had some kind of strategy for walking through, okay, here's a, here's a section with a particular technique, here's another, which at least, I mean, for me at least, that gave me a, that gave me a chance to in, enjoy it more somehow, in that I wasn't, I wasn't doing actually what I'm doing in this interview, which is <laughs> sort of like assaulting people with uh, nothing but nonstop sort of approach to one thing. Um, it, it, do, do, do you get a, a sort of similar sense from that, it's kind of walking from one to another? I'm going to ask about the lights in yeah, a second, yeah, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, there are these kind of um, parts that op 
apparently don't seem to have any development, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's a little bit like a like pattern, like a like a meta structure of patterns. If you look f uh, from from above at the structure of the piece, then you will <clears throat> you will look at uh, you know bold. Uh, colors for for each part, but um, within the there's it hardly it seems any kind of composed element within the parts. Um, maybe there is, but um, I would say th it's largely dealing with uh, sound blocks also. So, sound blocks. Mm. How do you mean? Well, yeah, these these kind of um, structures that are there. On that kind of uh, contain themselves, and they're just juxtaposed with other material, and then there's something else coming next to it. And um, sure. yeah. yeah, okay. So the, like literally the sonic um, sort of sonic entities that are that are happening, and the, which also I guess exist as these are also existing as entities in in the code, right? Well, it's a shame that we don't have your collaborator sort of with us to talk about this, but also to me it was really striking the the sort of synesthetic relationship that was happening. Um, also because it gave us a chance to kind of reflect on what we were uh, what we were perceiving in through a visual medium as well as through a, a sonic medium. How how connected were those uh, were those visuals to to the sound? I mean, it seemed like in some cases they were reproducing some an analog to a particular technique and sound. It um, certainly there was some kind of dramatic formal um, correlation, um, but but how how closely conducted was the was the lighting effect to the to the sound structure? Well, you you tell me, but uh, um, no, but technically there was no connection really between those, and I think one of the reasons. For 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 that decision not to you know hardwire these uh, elements is that um, then I mean it's so something so obvious that you would do that you know make it like a light show that where everything uh, like a sound audiovisual piece where 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 everything is hardwired and and everything is like super. Um, you know, tacky somehow, and uh, I think we prefer this a little bit more playful and and open, um, and also you know take off some of the of the of the tackiness, if you want, uh, of you know this kind of way that something is there to impress, or you know that is you know a big light show um, when it is really hardwired. So that it leaves a little bit more gaps in in that kind of. Perception and and you know plays around with with stuff a bit more. So no one in the, any rival audiovisual artists from Berlin in the audience that we're maybe trash talking in the process of saying that. No, unfortunately not here. Um, well, so there's to 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 clarify, there's no control structure at all between the lighting and the sound, is what you're saying. Well, there there is. Uh, we did a rehearsal. Um, mm -hmm. We we tried things out, but there's no you know hardwired OSC control or uh, uh, audio extraction mapping to visual parameters or anything like that. So just one of you starts and the, the, and the sound is starting and the, the lighting is starting. Yeah, it's very loose, yeah. But I mean, there must be moments where you're coordinating or I mean, certain things are happening at the same time, right? Yeah, well, we have these, we, um, it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a, Piece. It has a choreography, if you want, or like a structure uh, that is interchangeable or that can change the order. But uh, and obviously there, there are you know, certain arrangements or certain agreements uh, that we have uh, come upon. But um, yeah, it just the technical synchronization of it is is very loose and very open by deliberate okay. means. Yeah. Did, how did you talk about uh, about the relation, or did you talk about the relationship between the two? Mm, well, since I've worked with Carsten uh, a while, and I we kind of he knows my music, and I kind of know what he's interested in in the visual domain. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew that he is interested in the fact that. You know, these kind of lights are, as objects, also very ubiquitous 
kind of almost, I mean, they're kind of serious lamps, but they also have this pretty ubiquitous um, party technology um, aspect about them that we really like, that it is kind of a, it has this humorous aspect also, almost like a, you know, something that is making a choreography out of our ballet of, of these kind of rather um, ubiquitous gadgets that you may find in, in club contexts or in, you know, in, in theaters and so on. Right, I was going to say, probably not for everybody, but for anybody who hangs out in clubs or the clubs with clubs with that kind of lighting or theaters or uh, the Sound and Light Expo at Frankfurt Messe last uh, or motor earlier shows, this month. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sure, sure. Um, and it did seem to me, too, that the, maybe, it's, maybe it was because I read them that way, but also just sort of the movement of them, the kind of sounds that they're making, the way that they're choreographed. It, it seems like they kind of take on this personality of being a set of characters on stage that are, that are part of this. Is, is, is there a kind of drama, dramaturgy to this? I don't know. Characters rob like little robots, or I don't know. There, there might be this aspect, but you know, we, I guess every, I, or I hope everyone takes something else from it. You know. Mm.